Thank you, Dr. Cruz. Thank you, Dr. Jamison, and to the members of the planning committee to allow me to come here today, and it's delightful to be here in San Diego, as always. And uh, welcome from Florida. We're uh, we're in northern Florida, way up here. Not so many palm trees, but a lot of swamps, uh, nice clear water springs, alligators, uh, football uh, seen right there. So welcome to Florida. Um, we've been interested for a long time in aberrant gene regulation in cancer and starting with sequence-specific transcription factors. Uh, about seven, eight years ago, Dr. Varmus, when he was director of the NCIA, started the provocative questions. One of them being, uh, can we develop approaches to discriminate between driver and passenger epigenetic events? There's a lot to parse in that sentence, but let's say an epigenetic event is some real big change in gene methylation, histomethylation, something like that. What underlies that? And I think the genome sequencing really uh, really laid bare what, what's causing this. This is Gotti Getz's study, where he compares uh, the commonest uh, uh, gene mutations across any one tumor versus all tumors. And it's sort of a matrix here, a threat matrix. In the upper right-hand corner, you have your friends, our, our, our foe, I would say, P53, RAS, PI3KCA. But in here in circles, in here in this upper right-hand corner, are many different chromatin regulators. So the chromatin regulators are mutated, often inactivating mutations uh, in, uh, in, in, amongst the commonest sets of mutations in all cancers and causing uh, wholesale reprogramming of gene, gene expression in ways that can be quite deleterious to the cell. There are other ways besides these inactivating mutations discovered by uh, genome sequencing. There are other ways that the chromatin regulators can be affected in cancer, including overexpression of these types of proteins. Their dominant interfering complexes, such as DNA uh, methyltransferase, uh, site-specific mutations that seem to interfere with normal DMT3A, MLL fusion proteins are another example, and very rarely. Very rarely, there are point mutations that are gain-of-function mutations. And we, we happen to be interested in NSD2, uh, has several different names, and causes a, 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 um, a bottom line is it causes a global clomid pathology both by overexpression and by a gain-of-function point mutation. So this protein has several uh, different names. Uh, it was called uh, MMSET by uh, my colleague uh, Leif Bergsegel, who identified it as a recurrently rearranged protein in about, uh, in about 15 to 20 percent of cases of multiple myeloma associated with chromosome 414. So we called it multiple myeloma set domain protein, and set domain proteins are histomethyltransferases. Uh, it subsequently was identified as a potential uh, candidate gene for the wolf hirschhorn syndrome, uh, and, and Kurt Hirschhorn was a colleague at Mount Sinai, so it's kind of cool to know someone who a syndrome is named for. But it's got now the no more pedestrian name after a big e email uh, to all of us saying, let's just call it NSD2 because it was too confusing, so that's the new name for this. So anyway, uh, this, what's notable about this rearrangement is these patients, even with modern uh, uh, triple uh, drug therapy and stem cell transplantation for myeloma, these patients tend to relapse more frequently. They have a reasonable initial response to therapy, but they will fall out of remission after stem cell transplant more often. We collected cell lines uh, from Mike Hill at the NCI, uh, who had a whole panel of, of cell lines uh, from myeloma he collected. These have the 414 translocation. These don't. These all have overexpression of NSD2 MM set. Uh, usually there's two isoforms, a long and a short. There's some shorter forms you see here. That's because the chromosomal rearrangement can cut off a little bit of this first domain. But the rest of the protein is always overexpressed, including the set domain. And notably, in every cell line that has this overexpression, we have this striking change in chromatin modification. A histone 36 dimethylation is increased, and K27 a trimethylation is decreased. And these two marks are actually mutually exclusive with one another. Histone 36 uh, dimethylation is a mark that's associated with gene activation. It's found enriched at promoters near the start site of transcription. And by contrast, histone 27 trimethylation put on by the polycom complex in EZH2 is a mark associated with gene repression. These two marks are mutually exclusive. There's no such thing by our mass spectrometry studies as a histone tail that has a K27 trimethyl and a K36 dimethyl. The systems are set up to oppose each other, so this just doesn't happen. It's a switch. 
Uh, and in fact, the recent study uh, looking at aging tissues had some interesting results. As, uh, as you may know, that when we replicate, we uh, have a different histone uh, H3. Histone 3.1 is found in our chromatin, whereas uh, as uh, you, the cells stop replicating, the uh, replication non-dependent histone 3.3 is put into, uh, into our chromatin, such that 98, 99% of our brain is histone 3.3 chromatin. There's very little 3.1, uh, because that's a post-mitotic tissue. So there's a correlation uh, recently of aging tissues as an organism uh, ages and the tissues age that you accumulate this K36 dimethylation on histone 3.3, whereas replicating cells tend to have a, a surfite of uh, 27 trimethylation, suggesting that this balance is really important for you know, understanding where we are in the age of our cell and perhaps in in, in the programming and regeneration. So just something I wanted to put in for the regeneration crowd here. Okay, this NSD2 is important for 414 myeloma cell growth. If you knock it down by shRNA, you get cells stop growing and they undergo a G1 arrest. We showed this several others as well. This nominates this protein as potentially being important for uh, myeloma cell growth. Uh, a very nice uh, tool that was developed about a decade ago from uh, Josh Loring at uh, Johns Hopkins in the pre-CRISPR-Cas9 era was arduously uh, made uh, homologous recombination knockout where you could knock out the rearranged allele. Uh, so this is called TKO, targeted knockout, that 414 allele is knocked out, or you knock out the wild type allele, leaving this rearranged allele present. Now what you see is in the non-targeted knockout, you have overexpressed MM set NSD2, the target knockout that's largely gone, and we can see that we have this chromatin switch from K36 dimethylation is high here and K27 is low, and this cell line, it's just the opposite, suggesting this NSD2 is driving this immunoblot detectable. Uh, by mass spectrometry, it's about an eightfold difference. So this means millions of nucleosomes. Every nucleosome is really, most nucleosomes are going to be affected by this. So it's different from just having a transcription factor, bring a, a histomethylation enzyme to one locus. This is happening all over the place, and it's uh, distinctly abnormal. So what we find, uh, as you can imagine, by I think this was uh, microarray before we had RNA-seq and subsequently shown by RNA-seq, there are genes that are turned on and genes that are turned off, uh, genes on and genes off. The genes that are turned on were interesting in these, uh, in these myeloma cells involved in adhesion, migration, somewhat of a reprogramming towards an aggressive behavior, and as well as some DNA repair genes. And there were genes that were turned off as well. How does this work? Uh, we, we looked at this by uh, genome-wide chip sick analysis to see where, what's happening to these chromatin marks with this overexpression of this protein. And what we find normally is in a uh, MM set low cell, NSD2 low cell, there are these peaks and valleys of, uh, of K36 dimethylation that correlate near start sites of transcription. But when NSD2 MM set is high, this is all ablated, and the K36 dimethyl mark is pretty much everywhere. Uh, this is a very uh, uh, tightly bound, a protein is very tightly bound to chromatin. You can't extract it from nucleus unless you treat the nucleus with uh, nucleases. It's really very tightly bound. So I think when a cell replicates, it just gloms on to your nascent chromatin and just puts this mark on. And what it does, therefore, is it precludes on genes like this that are activated uh, by NSD2 overexpression, it precludes the K27 trimethyl mark and deposition of EZH2, therefore, apparently, turning genes on because of that system that's set up against each other. The K36 dimethylation precludes the polycomb protein for acting, and we get aberrant gene activation. We, though we get some, even though the K27 methyl marks are low in these MM set high cells, we do get some genes repressed. And we do see a pileup of K27 methylation at some sites. There seems to be some sites in the genome where the NSD2 can't get to. And those are sites where the uh, EZH2 and uh, K27 mark does appear, and uh, we can increase that mark. Um, so we think that we found that these sites are near insulator sites, near CTCF insulator sites, suggesting there's some sites in the genome NSD2 can't get into, and those get apparently repressed and reprogrammed.
So the basic idea is this. Normally, EZH2 is at a repressed gene, NSD2 is at an activated gene, and they have their own domains. When MMS is so overexpressed, we're basically apparently displacing EZH2 from some genes and pushing it onto other genes, creating this really uh, a kind of a mess of gene expression program. It's not physiological. It's quite pathophysiological. So the first part, uh, say here, is basically the idea here is that we have a global change of chromatin uh, by aberrant activation repression. And actually, our colleague Jane Scott has uh, been doing some 3D uh, chromatin mapping, showing that chromatin looping is dramatically different in these cells. And we're doing some collaborations with her going forward. Next part I'd like to say is this NSD2 protein has another essential role, and in, in that's in DNA damage and repair. And it's not completely elucidated, but there have been several papers to suggest that NSD2 is recruited to sites of double-stranded break, and perhaps by its chromatin remodeling uh, uh, modification activities, other activities, it may actually uh, augment uh, DNA damage or repair. So we looked at this ourselves using two systems, first being the typically used U2S osteosarcoma sarcoma system, where we knocked down uh, MMSET with siRNA, and then we looked at um, DNA damage by first by non-homologous end-joining assay, which is simply antibiotic resistance with a linearized plasmid. You get a lot of colonies, but if you knock down NSD2 MMSET, you get fewer colonies, suggesting that this linearized plasmid is less able to integrate by non-homologous end-joining into the genome. And using a uh, homologous recombination assay, we see decreases in homologous recombination as well. And one of the reasons for this is that when we knock down uh, MMSET NSD2 in these osteosarcoma cells, we lose two very critical components of DNA damage repair, uh, RAD51 and CTIP. So we think that NSD2 is required for expression of these critical DNA damage repair genes. And if you lose it, then you're not going to repair damage very well. So that might explain part of the problem. The other issue we want to know is we know that these patients with this 414 myeloma respond poorly to chemotherapy. They relapse. Does this uh, DNA damage response have anything to do with it? So one thing we noted is if we um, we have our uh, uh, NSD2 MMSET high cell, uh, and we do a microcochal nuclease digestion of the nuclei, we find the chromatin is quite accessible. But if we knock down NSD2 by a short hairpin, we find the chromatin is quite condensed. So we might have DNA that's open. That K36 mark tends to keep chromatin open. The K27 keeps it closed. By that global shift, we might have a, a more open and fragile chromatin. In fact, we find just grown in the wild, these MMSET high cells have an elevated number of P53 BP1 foci, suggesting that they're spontaneously undergoing more DNA damage just as they're replicating. However, a bit of a paradox ensued when we treated these cells briefly with a pulse of bleomycin as a stand-in for a DNA damaging agent. We treated for an hour, washed out the drug, and said, how long does it take for these cells to repair their damage? So here we see the bleomycin for an hour. We get these long uh, tail moments, these comets. And then uh, in the MMSET high cell, within one hour, all that damage is repaired. But the MMSET low cells still have damage. So these cells are just churning through and repairing their DNA very rapidly. And in fact, these cells uh, with MMSET high cells tolerate the bleomycin, where the MMSET low cells uh, lose viability. When we use melphalan, the drug that's typically used for myeloma, we find that the MMSET low cells undergo a G2M arrest. The MMSET high cells have some arrest, but they're still cell cycling. So these cells seem they're not, they're probably they're repairing their damage fast enough that they're keeping on cycling, and they seem somewhat immune from the uh, anti-myeloma therapy. Um, why might this be? Uh, we have you know, one possibility we came out from uh, trying to isolate NSD2 partners. Now, as I said, this is very hard to extract proteins, so the way we got at these partners is by creating a, a version of NSD2 that has a promiscuous biotinylation uh, tag on it, which biotinylates all of its nearest neighbors. Then we pull out those nearest neighbor proteins by streptavidin beads and ask what they are. And what we found, uh, one thing that we found here was PARP1 and a number of PARP substrates as well. So we wondered, could this PARP1 relationship be real? 
Um, we do find there's a, here's an IP PARP blot NSD2. There's some interaction. IP NSD2 blot PARP, there is some interaction. Not stoichiometric, but there is some interaction. And what we then tested these NSD2 high versus low cells for uh, susceptibility to PARP inhibitors. And uh, lo and behold, we found that these NSD2 high cells are more susceptible to PARP inhibitors, suggesting there, there may be that the NSD2 is helping recruit PARP, helping to repair that DNA damage at a rapid rate, and therefore kind of addicted to the PARP activity, maybe this being a potential therapeutic for this type of myeloma. Our simple-minded model is simply that the DNA stranded break, NSD2 is recruited, may modify chromatin at the break, and also may help recruit PARP to these breakpoint sites to help accelerate DNA damage, uh, and rep uh, DNA damage repair. So if NSD2 is overexpressed, causes chromatin switches, causes all kinds of genes that augment uh, growth, helps re rep repair DNA damage more rapidly, how, you know, would it be a good therapeutic target? Despite many companies trying, many private, you know, many labs trying, no one's got an inhibitor. But we, so we decided to model this uh, by knocking down NSD2 in a cell line that expresses a lot of it and giving chemotherapy. So here we knock it down, uh, we give chemotherapy, we do both, and then we watch these mice with a luciferase tagged uh, tumor cell. And what we can see is at the end of several weeks, uh, no treatment, all the mice are dead. Knocking down, one mouse had to be sacrificed, this mouse still has a tumor. Given chemotherapy, one mouse had to be sacrificed, for example, here. But the mice where we got rid of NSD2 and we gave chemotherapy, these mice are cured. So if we could get rid of this uh, agent, uh, this, this protein, and give chemotherapy, I think this would uh, be a good therapeutic strategy. So the second conclusion here is there seems to be a dual function. NSD2 is important for normal DNA repair. It keeps expression of key DNA damage sensors and repair proteins uh, supports their expression. And when you overexpress NSD2, it seems to accelerate DNA repair and may contribute to therapy resistance, possibly by PARP recruitment. Uh, and we think that if we inhibit NSD2, we'd accentuate the effects of chemotherapy. This would be a potential strategy for these 15% of patients that have this high-risk form of myeloma. Now, the last part of, of the talk, I'd like to mention NSD2 has popped up yet again in, uh, in pediatric acute lymphocytic leukemia. It is uh, found in, a, and this is a large study from the Children's Oncology Group, there are NSD2 mutations found in uh, in pediatric ALL patients. The most common is in a single amino acid site. I actually learned about this uh, by um, going to the Broad Cell Line Encyclopedia. The kind of experiments I do involve typing words into databases and coming up with some things. And I type in the word and out came, um, whoops, here we go. Whoop, oh, it just dip disappeared here. I don't know why it disappeared. There are, there are about a half dozen cell lines in the Broad Cell Line Encyclopedia that have heterozygous point mutations at a single amino acid site in NSD2. And then uh, there are a few different sites, but most of them cluster at this one residue, uh, uh, E1099 is changed to K. Um, additionally, uh, NSD2 is very highly expressed in uh, ALL uh, cell lines, and in patients uh, with relapsed ALL, uh, there's high levels of uh, NSD2. So there may be, NSD2 might be actually uh, driving uh, ALL biology in addition to its mutation. So um, again, there's a single amino acid here in the set domain, and there are the cell lines that, that I found. There's a one multiple myeloma cell line that has it, that's commonly used in the field. But it's infrequent in patients. Only one out of 200 patients has been found to have this mutation. And it's, there's a thyroid cancer cell line, but I haven't been able to get my hands on it yet to, to check it out. Anyway, what we did is we looked at the global chromatin profile of these cells. And despite the fact that MM said is not particularly overexpressed, over here it's not even very, over here uh, it's overexpressed here compared to there. It's not, these levels are not that much higher than this one. But still, we have this K36 dimethylation increase and K27 trimethylation decrease. The same thing we saw went over expression by this single amino acid mutation. This mutation is not in the catalytic site, but it's at the entrance 
of the enzyme where the histone tail fits in. And by molecular dynamic simulation, we actually uh, believe it creates a larger surface area for that histone tail to bind to the enzyme uh, and create a more stable interaction. To prove that the point mutation causes the chromatin abnormality, we used allele-specific uh, CRISPR. We were actually able to either uh, convert the mutant to a uh, wild type or uh, simply ablate the mutant allele. We did this in several different cell lines. Here's one example. Here's our parental cell line, non-targeted. This has the uh, this has the high K36 methylation, low K27. These are isogenic cells where we converted uh, to wild type or removed the mutant allele. And in both of these cases, we lose the K36 and gain back the K27, proving that this point mutation is causing the chromatin abnormality. What we find biologically is that these cells, that these are the, the cells with the point mutation in red, will remove the point mutation, the cells slow down in growth. They are less clonogenic in soft agar, these cells barely forming any colonies at all. And when we inject them into nude mice to model their behavior, we saw something very interesting. Uh, we found that the cells with the mutation, the mice, uh, have to be sacrificed usually by 20 days because they have uh, hind limb paralysis and CNS infiltration. But the, cell, the mice uh, without the mutation live longer. And when we quantify the, the amount of tumor cells in their bodies by luminescence, uh, we find that here's the time of uh, endpoint of the experiment in the mice with the mutation. Here are the mice that live an extra week or two longer. They're getting 10 to 100-fold more cells in their body as measured by luciferase, yet they're not symptomatic. When you take a look at the scans, you understand why. Here are the mice with the mutation, and they're having a huge accumulation of cells in their brains. By histopathology, we find it's not only meningeal involvement in these mice, but it's actually brain invasion, which is rare in childhood ALL, but it's usually leptomeningeal. But these mice are getting brain involvement, whereas if we remove the point mutation, they get a more homogeneous distribution of leukemia cells in the brain and the body, and the cells are confined to the leptomeninges. When we look at gene expression profiles of these leukemic cells, with the mutation seen in red, these are the cells with the mutation, remove the mutation, these genes go down in blue, meaning most of the genes affected in these isogenic cell lines are activated by the mutation. And that makes sense. The K36 methylation prevents the K27 trimethylation, which is repressive. We get a barren gene activation. What are these genes? Uh, what we did is we compared the isogenic cell line uh, RNA-seqs from three different cell lines. We find there's about 83 genes in common. And these genes are distinctly abnormal to the hematopoietic lineage. They're neural uh, adhesion genes. Neurogenin, um, there's, um, the, the, all these things here are distinctly neural adhesion molecule number two. Maybe this explains why these cells are going to the brain. And when we take a look using single uh, pathway analyses, we find a signature of epithelial mesenchymal transition, neuronal systems, uh, dopaminergic release. That's not normal for, uh, I think, uh, hematopoietic cells. And when we map them using this MJN database, where we take those 83 genes and put them into the database, we find that uh, they really cluster over here in a stromal cell signature. So these are distinctly abnormal to the hematopoietic lineage. Lastly, we, what has been observed clinically in these, uh, these NSD2 mutations is they're found in kids in 1% of their cells at diagnosis and 100% at relapse. So it seems to be mutation selected for in relapse. And why might that be? And it turns out that these cells with the point mutation are glucocorticoid resistant, seen here. If we remove the mutation, they become glucocorticoid sensitive. And this is mainstay of childhood ALL therapy. So this may be that you're giving the child this, this multidrug therapy, and those kids that are relapsing, uh, if they have this point mutation, it allows them to escape the effects of glucocorticoids. In fact, when we treat these cells, uh, the, the mutant cells with uh, glucocorticoids, we find, uh, seen over here, this is a, a, a parental cell. These cells uh, do not undergo any cell cycle arrest and do not um, 
uh, this is vehicle and uh, this is the dexamethasone. Here's uh, the wild type cells. If we, if we convert them back to a wild type allele, now these cells undergo a G1 arrest and apoptosis in response to glucocorticoids. And when we take, uh, when we actually uh, put these into mice, uh, we can uh, take, uh, inject these cells into mice and then feed the mice dexamethasone in their water. We see a decrease in body burden only in the, um, in, in, in the not in the mutant mice, but the cells line where the, the NSD2 is converted to wild type. And this is shown over here. These mice have an extension of lifespan compared this to that compared to this is the mutant cells without and with dexamethasone. If anything, these mice happen to have done worse. So it looks like in vitro and in vivo, uh, removal of this mutation creates glucocorticoid sensitivity. Um, and why might this be? We're beginning to get hints from some uh, gene expression analyses. Particularly look over here. This is the fold change, look over here, of BH3 only proteins in the presence versus the absence of dexamethasone in the mutant cell line. There's no induction of these BH3 only. But now, if we remove that point mutation, now we turn on BIM and BAD and these other BH3 only proteins. So there may be that we're failing to turn on the glucocorticoid-induced genes that are important for uh, cell death. So finally, uh, this gain-of-function mutation increases K36 dimethylation, activates genes, activates an abnormal neural program, really reprograms this cancer cell in a very different way, stimulates growth and adhesion, causes glucocorticoid resistance, and likely has a role in a subset of pediatric patients with ALL who relapse early from therapy. Our open questions is why uh, NSD2? One possibility is because it's critical balancing role against uh, PRC2, EZH2, in, uh, in keeping uh, genes on versus off, and perhaps in these uh, different histone variants. The histone 3.1 variant in a, in a replicating cell tends not to have much K36 dimethylation, and this will, it tends to be K27 trimethylated, and this would push the balance away from K27 trimethylation and keep genes uh, on. Uh, what pathways? So far it seems to be these uh, genes involved in uh, neurogenesis, adhesion, but we're trying to now uh, create guide RNA libraries to determine which one of these genes or any of these genes quite nodal in causing this uh, growth, uh, uh, growth advantage and invasion, and any of those could be targeted since we do not have any anti-NSD2 uh, drugs. And how? How do we overcome this resistance? Uh, NSD2 inhibitors, I said, are not present. Uh, we're wondering if there's any synthetic lethal uh, experiments. Uh, are there other susceptibilities that this NSD2 mutation causes? And we're trying that using CRISPR experiments as well. And finally, uh, thank you very much for your attention. This work started uh, at Northwestern, continues at the University of Florida with a number of collaborators and funding agencies. Thank you very much. Yanis. Well, Jane, Jane has actually presented some of this at our FASA meeting over the summer. Um, one of the things that happens is by getting rid of the K27 methylation, there are new opportunities for enhancer active uh, factors to access some enhancers that it wouldn't have before. So you end up getting uh, more enhancer engagement, uh, more K27 acetylation at key enhancers, and some new loops are forming. Uh, She's done that with the overexpressed cells. We just sent her uh, pellets from all of our gene edited cells for her to go and look at the same thing in the gene edited cells. So I think there, there could be some large scale reprogramming. Julian. Yeah, maybe two quick questions. In, in the kids, we, we, we have the mutation. Shouldn't they be treated with chemo then instead of glucocorticoids? I mean, you, could you use that as a personalized medicine? Because you, you showed in the other models that they are more sensitive to chemo. Well, we're going back and doing it again, but we found at least 
at least two different chemotherapies we tried on those isogenic cells were less effective, suggesting, again, we, we haven't done it in any of the detail we did with the overexpressed cells, but I think there's a DNA repair difference in these cells as well that we're going to get to now in more detail. And maybe the other question, I mean, I, maybe I missed it, but in the, um, what about if you inhibit EZH2 in the NS2? And is it too high? Because you have a few genes that are repressed, but what if these few genes are really key? We, we did that. Uh, we published it. I didn't have time today. I edited that. But we did find there is a, some, the cells with high NSD2 MM set that rearrange the EZH2 to key genes are somewhat more sensitive to EZH2 inhibitors. So we published that a few years ago. Yes. Can I? Yes. Please go ahead. Uh, so I just wanted to say that's a beautiful example of a resistance mechanism. Uh, in your personal opinion, regard it as an epigenetic or a genetic mechanism. It's a really nice intermingling. <laughs> well, it's, it is a, um, I, these are really a special case. You know, there are, there are some examples of genetic mutations that are causing widespread epigenetic consequences. The other one is set D2 mutations found in renal cell cancer, for example, which affects the histone 3 lysine 36 trimethyl mark, which is found in gene bodies and prevents aberrant splicing, prevents fact, uh, adventitious reinitiation transcription. Kind of, again, it wrecks havoc with normal gene regulation. So it's a genetic mutation that leads to a much, a very widespread uh, set of genes being affected. Um, and and I, think, I think these mutations are being selected for because they are so permissive of so many other, so much other havoc. So that's another, it's, I would say it's a genetic yields epigenetic yields mayhem. There was another, <laughs> there was another question, I think. Yes. So do you see a change in the gain of function with CTCF or cohesin? We haven't, uh, have we seen H, I, I think there, we haven't done the looping studies there, but I think, you know, we, we, we would probably see some changes. Um, though there is, there is um, something qualitatively different. There's quantitative and qualitative differences between the point mutation overexpression. Quali quantitatively, with the overexpression, there's an eightfold change in the histone marks. With the point mutation, it's about threefold. Geographically, we don't know yet. We're doing that chip seek now to know if that chromatin mark is happening everywhere or is it only happening focally and maybe laterally spreading a little bit? Because we don't have that excess protein to go and stick everywhere in the chromatin. So where is that happening? Is it happening at promoters, enhancers? Is it affecting CTF sites? Is it affecting looping? All, all good questions to be answered. Another question, is NSD2 parlated? It's is binding it, PARP. Is it correlated? It is. It is. We just, uh, actually, this is, uh, it was actually, again, from databases, uh, Steve Elledge's database of every correlated protein, uh, looking in the index, you know, uh, download the supplemental files and just look, it was correlated. But then we confirmed it ourselves that we can induce its correlation. And we think the parlation uh, sites may be important for maintaining the stability of NSD2 because it looks, it looks um, pre um, preliminarily, when we mutate those PAR sites, this, the protein is less stable. Um, yes. So I was wondering if you've looked at NSD2 alterations in other uh, cancers that are treated with hormone-based therapies such as prostate um, with, or uh, breast cancer, and is it a resist potential resistance mechanism that could be resensitizing? There is a number of papers. We published a few years ago, a rule Shanine did as well, that NSD2 is overexpressed in metastatic prostate cancer. We showed that NSD2 overexpression in prostate, benign prostatic epithelial cells creates an epithelial mesenchymal switch with the upregulation of TWIST1. There's been a few other papers published a few years ago also um, uh, hinting towards an, uh, uh, NSD2 uh, co is highly expressed in metastatic tumors, and it may have a similar effect in other types of tumors. Uh, again, I think it's a compelling target in, 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 in hematologic and non-hematologic tumors. There was one other, yes, sir. So um, does K36 uh, dimer stations are only simple uh, NSD2? Can you say that again, please? 
uh, K thirty six demonstration is uh, only uh, um, and there's there's varying reports in the literature. Uh, there has been a report that it could uh, affect histone four methylation. Uh, there is a report from one group it could affect K twenty seven methylation. In our mass spectrometry studies where we actually go down and look at the individual histone tails, the only effect we see is a, in, a, in an upregulation with the increase of, of NSD2 activity is K36 dimethylation. We haven't seen then anything else. Um, in vitro, it is promiscuous. You, you can, if you add it to a histone uh, 4, it'll methylate it. it probably it's on histone... Uh, lysine residue 44 in histone 4, it will methylate other histone residues uh, on, on, on pure uh, histones, but in a nucleosome, actually, it only methylates K36 and only dimethylates it. So, I'm sorry, there's a last question. So, so what's, the, what's, what's your proposed model to how, how K36 dimethylation can active genes? Because uh, I mean, maybe 10 years ago, some people claimed that uh, K36 demonstration can recruit uh, RDP, uh, RDP3S, which is a uh, uh, um, transcription elongation during the gene body. But right now, you claim that K36 demonstration is uh, enhancers and the promoters. So what's the function of them? So I think the question is, how do I think the K36 dimethyl mark is working? Is that, is that the question? There is a link, there is a link, there was a paper by Keiko Zato implicating um, uh, NSD2 in binding to HERA and putting in the H3.3 histone chaperone and helping elongation and loading the proper histone along there. Uh, we also know NSD2 binds to BRD4, which is involved in, um, which is involved in uh, promoter enhancer looping and uh, record, re recruiting T PTFB in the elongation complexes. Um, I think, um, you know, I, I, the de detailed molecular mechanism is still a little bit unclear, and that K36 dimethyl mark is not as well studied as some of the others. So I don't have all the answers for you today, but great question. I appreciate all these questions. Thank you very much. All right. Well, let's go ahead and thank Dr. Licht again. Thank you.